Canada is home to the longest coastline in the world. Stretching along the Pacific, Arctic, and Atlantic basins, it represents one of the most complex aspects of Canada's physical geography. Small harbors and coastal infrastructure along Canada's coastline are increasingly vulnerable to changing climate, manifested by rising sea levels, changes in sea ice climatology, as well as changes in waves and wind extrema. Comprehensive information on these extrema are required for engineering purposes in designing mitigation and adaptation strategies for infrastructure as well as for constructing new infrastructure that will last into the future. Many government agencies, such as the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Environment and Climate Change Canada, and Natural Resources Canada, among many others, have been developing models and data sets that assist with this problem. Unfortunately, many of these data sets are not operable with one another, and they tend to be complicated and not hard, not easy to use. So what is required is a platform where we can bring together these data sets and merge them into a single user-friendly platform where a suite of user tools will enable engineers and scientists to query multiple sites across the coastline. Hello, my name is Matthew Asplund and I am with West Coast Oceanography Inc doing business as ASL Environmental Sciences. And I am joined today by Ed Ross of Trailmark Systems. Of, uh, both companies are of Victoria, British Columbia. And we are here today to present to you the final proof of concept for the Canadian Coastal Zone Information System. So this system has been developed over the past uh, six months over a course of a number of milestones involving uh, front-end and back-end server development data integration, user tool development, and uh, front end uh, user tools and uh, interface. And we have arrived at a user-friendly Windows 10 compatible uh, system with a minimal amount of user input required in order to drive the system. On the left-hand side here of the screen, you'll see a menu. This menu is the primary interface in which to select different uh, bathymetry sets and oceanographic data sets, statistics, tools, as well as data on boreholes and uh, site infrastructure drawings. Some uh, examples of data that are available through the system are shown here with the statistical analyses types. So we have basic statistics covering one to many years, joint frequency tables covering one to many years, largest events, several years or more, Extreme value return periods, for example, for an event returning every out of one or a five, 25, 50, and even 100 year return frequencies. We also have relative mean sea level rise for periods greater than 25 years. On the right hand side, we have examples of a specific output that, will, that can be uh, exported through CSV format, which you can easily open in a text editor, Excel, or another program. And some examples of this data are given for Prince Rupert in this format, where we see we have 90 full years of data. And we, from this, can pull a mean sea level rise of 0.134 meters, and also is given as a rate in meters per year. An example of wave statistics from La Have Bank are given uh, below as basic statistics as well as extreme values. So on the left, we have an example showing significant wave height as the average 95th percentile and maximum lows. We also provide information on peak period for the corresponding significant wave height with 8.3, 9.8, and 14.3 seconds respectively. On the right hand side, we have an example of extremal wave return period. So we have the significant wave height that would return, be expected to return at the given return interval given on the left. So as you can see for this particular site, this ranges from 9.63 meters all the way up to 17.41. 
Now, a broader look at the data available in the Canadian Coastal Zone Information System. We um, have included data sets for historical as well as future projections covering marine winds, waves, sea ice, as well as tides, storm surge, relative mean sea level, and vertical allowance. Using information from the CMIP-5 uh, ensemble of climate projections for different climate scenarios, referred to as uh, uh, relative concentration pathways or RCP scenarios, we've included information for projections on all of these variables from RCP 2.6, 4.5 and 8.5. We have also integrated information from other systems that are available, such as the uh, Canadian Extreme Water Tool and the um, Canadian uh, Coastal Risk Assessment System, as well as many other data sources as they become available. We also have the ability to integrate and add additional data sources as they become available in the future. All right, with that, I'm going to now turn over to Ed Ross of Trillmark to uh, demonstrate the system. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, first, just check that you can hear me okay. Is my audio coming through clearly? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Great, okay. Uh, thanks for that introduction. Yeah, um, so I'm Ed Ross, Senior Project Manager with Trailmark Systems out of Victoria, and uh, I've been working alongside <laughs> Uh, Matthew um, on this project and actually much further back uh, since we wrote the uh, proposal about a year before that. So um, I'm really excited to share what we've come up with today. So I'm just going to get the share, the screen share working here. Just bear with me. That should do it. Matthew, can you see my screen now? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, what we've been building is a web application. So I, I really wanted to start right at the, the start here by just bringing up my web browser. I happen to be using Google Chrome, uh, but we have tested this application in all the uh, major uh, browsers, that popular browsers that run on Windows 10. Um, so that includes uh, Edge and Internet Explorer and Chrome, uh, Opera, uh, Firefox. <clears throat> so I have it here open in Chrome at the login page. Uh, we've added a login. Uh, wrapper around the whole application simply to prevent uh, public access because it is live on the web. Um, uh, that, so that's, that's why I have to log in here. It's just a single account that every, everybody uses the same account. So I'm gonna log in and we get uh, immediately taken to this search uh, and browse uh, map. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the different features on this map. Um, but the first thing I hope that jumps out to you that, that as you're watching is that there's a number of points on the map. These uh, are all of the uh, small craft harbors that uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada uh, has listed as um, uh, either managing or, or uh, under their purview in, in some manner. There's about a thousand of them. Um, the reason we they're in here is to stress test the application. Uh, this phase one that we're just completing was a, a proof of feasibility. And part of that means um, understanding what the data volume and complexity needs would be in a uh, operational environment. And uh, although this app has been designed to uh, run and be tested in a simulated environment, uh, we wanted to take some strides towards uh, the final um, operational version of this application and make sure that uh, we were testing it, starting to test it under those conditions right from the beginning. So there's a um, thousand sites in here right now. Um, we figure that's somewhat representative of um, how much data would be in there in this application in a real live setting. Um, there's a couple of features on the map here. While the map itself, of course, is, a, is panable and, and zoomable, there's uh, in the bottom right here, there's a little flyout button that allows you to change the base maps. I, I tend to prefer the dark themed maps, but you can turn on the light themed. 
It's sort of a more classic uh, streets view where if you zoom right in, you'll start to see um, common features that helps orient oneself on the map, roads and airports and such. And then there's also a satellite view as well, which uh, we'll see is useful later on. I'll just uh, switch it back to my preferred dark view and zoom back out here. Another uh, feature that's on this map, as well as all the maps that you'll see throughout the application, is this. If I expand this little flyout button here, there's a few a few things that controls on it you should be aware of. The main one I want to point out is the ability to switch the projection on the fly. By default, the all the maps are in a web Mercator projection, which is a common format you can see all through web applications. Um, however, in northern latitudes, latitudes, it does lead to quite a bit of distortion um, in area. And you can somewhat see that here if you're familiar with the true sizes of, of Greenland, for example, compared to, uh, well, compared to Canada. Um, it's being distorted in this web Mercator view. So we can switch to something that's more uh, honors the um, areas better and doesn't distort them nearly as much um, through this Lambert conical conformal, sorry, Lam Lambert conformal conic projection. And so I'll just make that switch right now. You know, the way it works is when it's, when the poles are centered on the map, it's, just, it's essentially equivalent to an Arctic stereographic projection. And you can see now that the areas are uh, um, much less distorted. And although our demonstration uh, regions are on the west and east coasts of Canada, uh, it's envisioned that this application would be just as valuable to Northerners. Um, and so we feel that this being able to dynamically change the projection on the fly while you're in the middle of doing something without having to reload um, all of the content will become quite valuable in later versions of the, of the application. I will, for now, I'll switch it back to Web Mercator. There's also 3D and pitch controls here. Uh, I'll just quickly show you them, although they'll become more useful later. Pitch simply does what it says. It pitches the map, which we can turn around. Um, I actually tend to prefer to look at maps on an angle. I get a bit of vertigo looking at them straight down. Um, so I like that option. And I'll, also, there's a 3D capability. So there, there is terrain, a digital elevation model built right into all the data. And the map can be draped over that model to produce a 3D look. And we'll see how that's useful in a, in a moment. I'll turn those off for now. So that's a sort of general overview of the some of the mapping capabilities and the content. Uh, but yeah, so this page is really about finding the site, a site of interest. And so there's two ways to do that. Uh, you can simply browse on the map to a site. And you see as I move my cursor around, it uh, shows the name of the, the sites. This, in, this, in this case, they're small craft harbors. Uh, I can also search by text. I think we are going to now focus on our demonstration regions, which uh, one will uh, be situated around the uh, Prince Rupert, Ida Gwaii, Hecate Strait region of uh, British Columbia. And uh, later we'll be looking at uh, Prince Edward Island, Northumberland Strait, and the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So uh, yeah, and you start showing some, uh, some data sets from uh, Prince Rupert area. All right, let's do that. There's a small craft harbor by the name of Masset out on the west coast. So we're going to go there first. So I uh, type the name in, it, it'll shortlist. In this case, there's only one matching um, site. But if I was to do that again, maybe MA, uh, you'll see that the list starts shortening down until we find the one that, of interest. So click that, and uh, it zooms the, the map to that location, asks me if I'd like to view the details for that site. So I'm going to click yes. Now you'll see the page reloads. Zoomed and 
and to that uh, site. And then with some options, some new uh, options here to, to explore content around this area. And of course, we still have the same controls we had uh, for the map, the projection and 3D controls and the base map switcher in the bottom right. And there's a Latin long indicator here on the bottom left. Uh, if you notice, as I move my cursor around, it'll update with the location. And there's also the ability to put the app into a full screen mode. I, I won't be using that again, but I just want to point it out at this point. So up to Masset, I understand from Matthew that Masset uh, has some pretty strong tides. Um, so we chose that as an area to look at some of the tide data that's in the application. So on the left here are some categories of information, mostly uh, um, physical and oceanographic, um, although the, the uh, first couple are slightly different, but we'll see that later on. So we'll expand the tides category. And there's two options in here. Uh, many of the options have this little info button. If I click it, you'll get a little bit of information about the data set and a link through to the original source. I'll click it for this one just so you see how it works. It opens it in a new tab. Uh, I won't click for all of them, but you've seen how it, how it works for one. Um, so in this case, the data set contains information from the Canadian Hydrographic Service who operates tide stations all across the country. And so we'll turn that on, that layer. And you can see it's indicated by that, that blue marker there. If I Actually, if I zoom way out, you'll see many, many stations all around. Let's zoom back in. And by clicking on that marker, It'll retrieve some results that have been uh, calculated uh, by ASL based on the measurement data uh, acquired at the station. Some general statistics to begin with, just the, the first year that data was recorded in the last year. And within that span of data, the number of uh, years of, of high quality data that's available for analysis. Um, the stations themselves can be um, uh, can go out of uh, out of service for for lengths of time. So uh, the the year span that's represented by the first and last isn't always the uh, amount of data that's available. So that's why it's important to include this parameter. And then, but based on that, in this case, four point nine years of uh, tidal time series, uh, these values have been calculated. Uh, higher high water, large tide, higher high water, mean tide, and then the equivalent for the lower low water values. And all those are relative to chart datum in this case. I'm gonna save this for a little bit later, but I'll point it out now. Uh, for all of, you'll see many of these pop-ups as we go. And everyone has this down, orange download button. And when you click it, it'll download a CSV or comma delimited file with all of the same content that's, that's in this pop-up. Uh, you can, of course, just copy and paste it as well if you wish. Uh, but having in that CSV is just sometimes makes it a little bit smoother to get data out of here and into your other um, data processing, data analysis systems. Also, look at uh, another set of data here. This is from the Canadian Extreme Water Level Adaptation Tool, which includes tidal height predictions at various locations in Canada. Uh, so let's turn that on. In this case, same location as the CHS tide gauge. And now these heights are relative to different datum, which is indicated here, the Canadian geode geodetic vertical datum of 2013. And we have similar parameters, um, uh, the higher high water large tide and lower low water large tide. But now we also have available the tidal range, in which case it's quite large here, 4.37 meters, and the mean water level as well. Let's switch to another tab here, and we're going to do a bit of wave simulation next. So 
this is where I'm going to turn back on the 3D capabilities, which just look nice on the West Coast here. I really like, really like looking at this. But in any case, back to work. Um, here, just north from Lax Columns is Portland Inlet. And Matthew, do you want to talk a little bit about Arctic outflows and how they form in this area? Yeah, so <clears throat> we thought that uh, in demonstrating the, uh, the SMB wave tool, it might be nice to have a, uh, an application. So the, uh, of course, with the many fjords and valleys along the coast of British Columbia, we have uh, complex topography with the coastal mountain range uh, reaching heights of uh, you know, in excess of uh, 3,000 meters. And um, so, so meteorologically, what can happen is, uh, particularly in the wintertime, sometimes we can see the um, buildup of uh, very high pressure in uh, Arctic uh, air masses behind the mountains. And uh, the air can flood right down and uh, make uh, the interior of British Columbia quite cold. But uh, what will happen is the uh, isobaric pressure bars will align themselves along the coastline and uh, create uh, a gradient of high pressure inland and low pressure out over the ocean. And when this happens, it can uh, create exceptionally strong Arctic outflow winds, which is uh, effectively that pressure imbalance trying to correct itself through these uh, mountain valleys and fjords. And uh, in some cases, we can see outflow winds exceeding uh, 30 meters per second. So at, uh, at this particular location here in uh, Portland Inlet, we have uh, about 40 kilometers of fetch. So we thought we would uh, demonstrate uh, what, what happens when those out, outflow winds uh, were to come down a channel as such and uh, what implications it can have for both first nations as well as industrial and commercial uh, users of the, uh, the waterway. Well, thanks, Matthew. So let's uh, start one of these wave simulations. Uh, I've expanded the info box there just while Matthew was talking. So you have a chance to, if it shows up in the video, you have a chance to, to read a little bit about how the, uh, uh, what's behind the, the wave simulation tool. I'll just close that now. So how it works is we click this plus button here. And first thing we want to do is pick the point at which we want to simulate the uh, waves. Uh, so it would, um, as you're going to see in a moment, I'm going to draw the, the line along which uh, winds will blow and uh, generate waves um, uh, in that direction. So we want to pick the point at which the waves will arrive. So let's go with the mouth of the, of the inlet here. And you can see it's, it's instructing me, click to start a wave simulation at the current location. It's got the latitude and longitude and the little tool tip there as I move around. So let's just click this point here at the mouth. And as I move around, it'll update that, that tool tip. I'll move kind of slowly so it shows up hopefully in the video that you can see the length there is growing. Get up to 15 kilometers until we get to the sort of end of this arm of the inlet which, yep, you're right, Matthew, it's just over 40 kilometers. So I'll click that ending location. So that's now we're, we've defined the fetch over which the winds are going to blow and generate the grow waves. Um, so we need to provide uh, the details of the wind event. And we've chosen a, a wind event here for up 25 meters per second, blowing uh, for 12 hours. And we'll see what kind of wave that would produce. So it's sending that information off to another uh, server that's doing the, the number crunching. We keep the web serving and the uh, computational um, uh, uh, processes separate on different machines to, to uh, try to optimize the uh, performance. So it's done now, it just takes a few seconds and it turns on that layer and adds a marker to where we've simulated the wave. You'll see two actually, because we've done the, the this uh, previously and those markers get saved in association with the, the site I'm viewing. So we could 
go away, turn our browser off, shut our computer off, come back, and they'll still be there. Um, and so let's click on them and see see what's uh, what the results were. So there was a 25 meter per second wind blowing for 12 hours over almost 44 kilometers. And it produced a significant wave height of 3.4 meters and a peak period of 7.2 seconds. So all of this text here are where the inputs that you saw before and then the bolded text were the results of the, the wave simulation. So I think we've treated the West Coast pretty good. I think we should head over to the, the East Coast now. We'll zoom into Prince Edward Island here. It's at the, the point here is, or near the point, Sea Cow Ponds, small craft harbor. You'll see a, a few locations around. And one near Sea Cow Pond is this North Cape station, which I understand is a lighthouse. We zoom in on it. There it is there. <clears throat> and again, if we can click on the marker and get some summary uh, overview as well as some statistical results. So in this case, it's very similar to the wave presentation, but now we're looking at winds. Uh, so at the at North Cape, a maximum uh, recorded wind event of 27.22 meters per second uh, from 45 degrees. Uh, it's quite a long record. We've got 27. 0.3 years of, uh, of useful time series here to, to do analysis with, which ASL has done. And again, that's done by identifying uh, distinct wind events listed here with their peak speed and then uh, their uh, direction. And then those events are used to do uh, extremal estimation for of return values. In this case, uh, 28.55 meter per second wind uh, expected in uh, over uh, 100 years. Another tool we have in here is the ability to query quite a long sea ice time series. So I'll collapse these and turn, oh, expand this sea ice category here. So down here is a few um, sea ice related layers, map layers, actually two layers and one tool. So I'll start with this first, the, the CIS, CIS history tool here. CIS is the Canadian Ice Service who has been publishing ice charts that cover um, all the ice infested regions of Canada um, since the 1970s. So they represent a, a long, um, rich uh, archive that's uh, publicly available. If I click this um, plus button, it uh, instructs me to click a point. So well, we'll just stay in Northumberland Strait here. Click a point and it'll go off and do that um, querying. So it's drilling down through you know, that long time series. And we get three parameters here. So this first one is the earliest day in any given year where um, uh, where ice was present and the latest um, date. Um, and then also for that point over that full time series, um, the uh, median ice concentration at that location. Another great source of um, sea ice information is the CMIP 5 forecast. So CMIP 5 has uh, the, both sea ice concentration and sea ice thickness um, forecasts. Let's turn on uh, concentration first. And if I, I'll close that window and zoom out, you'll see the, the grid coverage, which is all of Canada, uh, different projections. Let's go back in to the East Coast here. So this is uh, the CMIP 5 grid, which is the same for all uh, parameters available from CMIP 5. And in this case, I have the sea ice concentration grid turned on. So we can click any of these, um, any of these points and it'll query for the results of that point. So what we're getting here is 
the 50th percentile of sea ice concentration uh, expressed as a percentage. And, the, and pardon me, the, the change in that relative to uh, 1986 to 2005 for uh, four different time periods of 20 years each, uh, spanning until the end of the century. Um, and that's given for three different uh, scenarios, uh, three different representative concentration pathways, the same ones we've been looking at before. The results from CMIP5 are also divided into uh, seasons. Um, so here, DJF corresponds to December, January, and February. This would be March, April, May, and so on. So if we look at September, October, and November in RCP 2.6, with a change of almost uh, 2% by the end of the century, compared to RCP 8.5, as a change of over 55%. And so those are available at all the um, CMIP five grid locations. I'll turn off the concentration and turn on thickness. <clears throat> Not all grid points have data, of course, but this here's a good one. Um, so this is the 50th percentile of sea ice thickness um, in, um, and the change in that in centimeters relative to that same time period, 1986 to 2005, all structured in the same way, 20-year uh, uh, forecasts, uh, or sorry, forecasts for 20-year um, uh, epochs, and uh, for three different RCP scenarios divided into seasons. And maybe we'll look at that same example here. So. September, October, November, and RCP 2.6 by the end of the century, a uh, 40, almost 41 centimeter, uh, 50th percentile change in uh, sea ice thickness, and over double that in the 8.5 scenario, actually almost getting up to a meter there. And so now I believe that covers off all the environmental parameters and climatological parameters. Uh, next, I'd like to just take a few minutes and show you some of the more site-oriented information that can be managed in, this, in the application. And for that, I need to go a bit further south to some sites where we were provided uh, um, uh, some sample data. And at this point, it's uh, just a, worth mentioning, or if not reminding that, New uh, site data sets, plans, and drawings can be added to the system as they become available at any time and permit users uh, to, uh, to also make updates to existing uh, entries on a regular basis. And we also can include available geotechnical borehole logs and, uh, and relevant information as well. Users can extract or calculate nearshore coastal parameters at required point locations, either from the available information or using our built-in computational tools right over where these site drawings are located. So I'll let uh, Ed show us a site drawing or two. Thanks, Matthew. We've gone back to the search page. We're gonna to go to one of the locations where we have some sample data. So here's oh, Solnierville, and you can see the, the, some of the shape of the harbor there. You know, just tilt it around, like I was saying before, I just like tilted maps, looking at maps tilted more than Straight on. Uh, so for this particular site, we have an Autodesk DWG file that contains uh, site plans and some other information. You'll see it in a moment. And we can add that to a site by going up to the site plan entry here and clicking the plus button. And it prompts us to upload a, a Autodesk DWG file. So click choose file. And I've got some samples here that uh, were provided to us. So this is the one for Solnerville here. Now uh, they all, uh, these all follow the national CAD standard, which means that the contents um, is divided up into layers and, and labeled consistently. So you'll see that. So here's the, the, the content of that DWG file. And I'll talk about the big blue um, stuff in a moment, but I'm just gonna turn that off. Uh, the orange lines there, that was line work from the drawing. 
or from the site plan you can see as I hover over uh, features, there's a, a code shown and these codes correspond to um, uh, entries in the National CAD standard. So the, for example, here M stands for marine feature, WF is a wharf. Um, this, uh, yeah, that looks like it's a, a breakwater. I saw BW there. And um, there's the berm of the breakwater. I think this might be the toe, yeah. Um, also in that DWG file, commonly are the results of uh, dredge surveys. Many of these harbors have to be regularly uh, dredged as part of their operations. And uh, uh, before and or after a, a dredge survey, a, uh, or sorry, before or after dredge operations, a survey, a bathymetric survey of the harbor um, is done at a high resolution. So that was the blue. I'm going to turn that back on here. Excuse me, detail in a moment. But before we move on from here, um, I also want to demonstrate this boreholes functionality. You can see it's all quite snappy. Um, now with those in there at any time, you can view them. So you just click on it and it'll show the, the borehole log and, and pull size. Um, now we can click around and see a few there. So we've got one more site to show you. We'll go back to the search. And we're going to lower Wedgeport, also in Nova Scotia. And this harbor here, you can see this is a site plan that's already been uploaded previously. A little tilt, and this one also happens to have bathymetry as well. Takes a few moments to load because it's quite a lot of data. Remember, it's that dense cloud of soundings. Uh, where there's um, this high resolution bathymetry, we can um, turn on a 3D view of this. So. Uh, so right now, all of those blue points are, are mapped at the sort of the same, they're all sitting on the same plane. Uh, you can get their depth by, by hovering. But to visualize the depth, um, we can click this 3D um, button. And so we can switch to this 3D view. So as soon as I click it, it'll, it'll overlay a, a new um, a dialog box or a, a box here over the whole screen, showing the same site plan, the line work from the site plan. And now we're seeing a um, color-coded uh, bathymetry depth layer, yellow being shallow and darker blue being deep. Um, and it's, it's all actually in 3D as well. So if I tilt it, you might start to see some relief in the different features here. Like here's that, that breakwater, um, I can twist it around. But the aspect, you know, this is all true to scale. Um, so the aspect ratio is making it quite difficult to see the relief. So we've added the ability to just exaggerate that relief um, artificially, but in order to, um, to visualize this, this data better. So you can you know, exaggerate it to as little or as much as you'd like. And with that, you might find it easier to orient yourself around to this data. And uh, I think maybe just subjectively or qualitatively, you can make out that the data within the harbor is, is higher resolution than, than outside. And again, that's that dredge survey data fused with the NONA 10 data outside. And I have gotten to the end of my demonstration. So thank you to uh, the viewers for your kind attention. And um, I'll pass it back over to you, Matthew. Thanks for um, letting me give this presentation today. Okay. And uh, thank you, uh, Ed, to you and your team for all your hard work and uh, helping make this happen. That we uh, certainly wouldn't have uh, produced and reached to a technology readiness level six uh, product without your support. So on behalf of West Coast Oceanography, thank you very much for all your efforts on this. And again, thank you to the uh, to the viewers and uh, to uh, to anyone uh, interested in more details. We do have a final report for uh, our uh, proof of feasibility. It is um, it is available, and we encourage you to review that for more information on all the data sets that are used, as well as uh, how the system was constructed, 
And I'd also like to draw specific attention to some key recommendations that we have made for future implementation in uh, phase two of the Canadian Coastal Zone Information System. Thank you very much and everyone have a good day.